Imagine, you're driving down the road. When you come to an intersection, you see several police cars and officers on either side of the road who demand you pull over. You've come to a roadblock. An officer approaches and asks you to identify yourself. He demands to see your driver's license and registration and shines a flashlight into your car, both the front and back seats, as you fumble nervously with your wallet. Just as you think you're about to be waved on, another officer approaches, led by a rather large German Shepherd. He walks the dog around the car, giving it extra time to sniff the trunk area of your car. Finally, the first officer indicates that you can continue on your way. Where are you? In a third world country somewhere? Perhaps a communist regime? No, you're in the city of Indianapolis. Welcome to the United States of America. Does the Constitution really allow this to happen? What keeps a police officer from searching your car on a whim? What are the limits of such searches? The Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution provides that citizens have the right to be free from arbitrary searches. Let me read it to you. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. To most people, this probably sounds like a pretty high standard for the police to meet. But how do we know when a search is unreasonable? In Indianapolis, the city government authorized the police to set up traffic checkpoints and stop motorists randomly. The main purpose of the checkpoints was to look for illegal drugs, but a secondary purpose was general crime prevention. The city operated six checkpoints from August to November of 1998. Police officers at these checkpoints proceeded in just the manner I described. If the dog alerted the officers, they would search the car. Or if officers had reason to be suspicious, they would search as well. The checkpoints were very successful. Of 1,100 cars stopped, 104 people were arrested, half for drug offenses and half for traffic offenses. But two of the drivers who were stopped sued in federal court. They alleged that the stops took place without any suspicion that the individual drivers had violated any laws. Therefore, they claimed the stops were an unreasonable search and seizure and unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment. The trial court ruled against the drivers, but the Court of Appeals then denied the city's right to perform random checks on drivers. Case was appealed to the United States Supreme Court. Now, what are some of the arguments for such checkpoints? Well, one is that the government has an important interest in fighting drug traffic. Drugs are quite easily hidden in cars, and it's hard to fight the war on drugs if police aren't allowed to use checkpoints. A second argument is that checkpoints worked. The police found a lot of drugs. Proponents also say these stops are minimally intrusive. They last on average only two to three minutes. And because the checkpoints stop every car and do not pick and choose among drivers, there's no threat of bias, racial or otherwise. Finally, proponents argue that cars were only searched thoroughly if there was specific reason to suspect illegal activity. What are the arguments against checkpoints? Well, it's claimed that citizens have a constitutional protection from police searches where there is no evidence of a crime. Opponents say the Fourth Amendment prohibits police from engaging in random searches, sometimes known as broad fishing expedition. Stops, they claim, must be supported by some reason to think that the law has been violated. Otherwise, they say, the danger of police abuse is very high, and opponents say the drug problem is not a sufficiently important government interest to allow the police to indiscriminately violate the individual's right to be free from random searches. The Supreme Court agreed with the plaintiffs, the drivers in this case, and delivered a 6-3 to three decision holding that the use of general checkpoints was unconstitutional. While the Supreme Court has allowed limited purpose checkpoints before, in this case it held that a, a general interest in detecting criminal activity was not important enough to waive important Fourth Amendment rights. In many other settings, however, the Supreme Court has favored the government interests over the rights of individuals. Let's consider some of the situations. Custom agents at LaGuardia Airport in New York are given authority to search travelers in their baggage without a warrant and without any basis for individual suspicion. In a 1977 case, the Supreme Court held that this quote, or the so-called airport exception 
to the Fourth Amendment was justified by what it said was the long-standing right of the sovereign to protect itself. There was a particularly bizarre instance in which a woman suspected of swallowing balloons filled with heroin was forced to stay in a small room for 24 hours until she defecated. No attempt was made by police officers to get a warrant. The Supreme Court actually upheld this in 1985. The Supreme Court has also held that cars may be stopped at border checks for brief questioning even if there is no individualized suspicion of a crime. This is because the government's objective of preventing illegal immigration is sufficiently important. But of course, the burden of such searches falls overwhelmingly on Mexican Americans. What about drunk drivers? Drunk driving is a very serious problem in the United States. But in a 1990 case called Michigan Department of State Police versus SITS, the court approved a roadblock similar to the one in Edmond. The difference was that the court held that roadblocks, in this case, were set up at night with the intention of getting drunk drivers off the road. Unlike the anti-drug rationale used by the government in Edmond, the court was persuaded that there was an immediate danger from drunk drivers to highway safety, and that therefore the sobriety checkpoints were justified. Indeed, in striking down the Indianapolis law in Edmond, the court wrote that it, quote, goes without saying that sobriety checkpoints are, un are constitutional. We live in a dangerous world. Most of us are sympathetic to the government's efforts to protect society from crime, particularly violent crime. No one seems to mind putting their baggage through an x-ray machine before boarding a plane, even though that could be considered a random search. But in traffic stops, the risk of racial and other forms of bias is real, and the inconvenience is more than trivial. 